good impact show. I am very happy on one thing. I am not saying that this was a spectacular show. It was good. And that's what I care about, ladies and gentlemen. I care about having a good show. I care about Impact giving us something consistent. I know a lot of people want to see a lot of flash, a lot of flair, a lot of great things keep building and building up really large. But I just want to see Impact give us a good show. It could be average. I don't care. Give us some average shows for a while just to show the show is doing well. The company is doing well because every time when they did such flashy stuff, we went like this. I know I don't need to keep reminding people of this, but I know there's a lot of people out there that think Impact's got his mojo back, and I'm not going there. I, I've seen some reviewers in the last couple of weeks, and it, 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 it upsets me that some of the people who have reviewed Impact are saying the show is so good now. It's going great. We got our stuff back. We got our mojo. It's like saying SmackDown's back on his feet again when we know it's not. And i rather wait for Impact a year and a couple of months later after they've had the new change in management to really say, okay, Impact is back to somewhere it was when it was with Spike in its quality, not quantity of viewers, but a quality of the show. That's what I'm hoping for, that the most best peak of Impact around maybe about 12 years ago or 9 years ago is when it was at nearing its peak. And that's where I wanted to be at. Not anything else. That's just me. I'm hoping to build into that. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is Brian Cage with, um, what was that guy's name? Um, Bartholom. I believe his name was Bartholom in Destiny Wrestling. Now, was it a good match? Yes. The Bartholomew kind of reminds me of someone who was on Reality of Wrestling when I used to review it. Guys, tell me below if you want me to go back to it. I haven't gone back to it in over a year now. Or nearly a year. I don't even remember most of what was going on in the show. So, if you guys want me to review it, tell me below if you want me to go back to it. But this match was okay. Brian K still looked kind of tanked, but... From what I understand from Andre, Andre Corbill, he did break his nose. And it's possible that he's been getting tanked way more easier because he has a brief for his mouth. Which, that can happen. And I'm hoping that his nose sets properly. Who wants to have a broken nose and it sets bad? Anyway, Brian Cage wins. Now the question is, where is he going now? He's been to Noah. He's been to Destiny. I don't know where else he's going. Maybe he'll go to AAA. Maybe. Maybe he'll go to Crash Wrestling again. Maybe he'll go to Border Sitting Wrestling. I don't know. We'll see where he's going. But I'm guessing that this is building up into no. What is it? Low pressure or no? What is it called? Um, Low pressure? What was it called again? Under pressure. There you go. Under pressure. I had it on my paper on the opposite side. I forgot. I knew I was going to forget. Under pressure is coming out in two weeks. That's the next pay-per-view before Slammiversary. At least that's what I think it is. So, this is going to be a question if he's coming back by then. We'll see. LAX again has a segment in the back with... Let, let me put it to you like this. Santana and Ortiz. I'm glad to see them talking. I want to see them have some interviews. Like I said personally, seeing them talk is what they've been needing for nearly two years. They needed it. They needed to be able to handle their business on their own without Conan there. The question's going to be, can they do more than just do backstage video packages and segments with other guys? Because it looked like they can. When it came to the Cult of Lee, Santana looked pretty good. Ortiz looked pretty good. I had no problem with it. But they need to elaborate more on it. They need some interviews and they need some promos in the ring. That's what I'm hoping for. If they keep doing these video packages only, I'm going to get worried. They think they just don't have it. And they're going to give them less of a shine that they deserve. Even if they're not that good. They need to be given a shine even if they can't talk very well. Because we've been waiting a long time. For, at least I've been waiting a long time just to see them be allowed to talk on their own. Now, um, we got the Pentagram Jr. and Phantasma. I'll give it to you like this. 
I'm glad they allowed Pentagram Jr. to talk. Even if Phantasma was with him and, and translated a little bit, they used subtitles, which I have no problem with. I've said this myself. Sometimes you need to do something like that with wrestlers that don't talk English. If they don't have very good ability to talk English or they don't talk English at all, give them subtitles. There's nothing wrong with that. And I really believe that's what's necessary. There's nothing wrong with that. Now the match itself. Could save this for the last, but you know what I want to talk about. Phantasma and Penta, not Pentagram, Pentagon Jr. I don't know why I said Pentagram. Pentagon Jr. versus Austin Aries and Seidel. It was a good match. There was a lot of high flying. There was a lot of grapple, which I'm really surprised. There were like two major botches. The first one was from Phantasma. When he do that um, arrow from hell against Matt Seidel, he came up really short. Barely touched him in the chest. You can see the picture in my face. And landed flat on his head. That was bad. Sometimes Lucha Libre has a double-edged sword. You can land the moves perfectly or it can go horribly wrong. That's one of the problems with high-flying wrestling. People love it, but there's such a very high chance of a severe injury or mild injury that sometimes you wish they wouldn't always go to it every single time. I know a lot of people love it and they'd rather see it go every single time, but let's be honest here. If you're being 100% honest, Wrestlers don't need to do high flying every single time to get you interested in wrestling. They can do other things. And people are so spoiled on heavy, heavy high flying, heavy brutality. They don't really care about the other things that can go on. Matt psychology, grapple wrestling, sometimes just having an attitude in the ring can make things so much more entertaining. And I really believe by going away from that, it's such a waste. Yeah, you can call me a very old, stupid man. Because I'm nearly 50. I'm an old, stupid man. I've been seeing wrestling since this, well, late 70s. Since I was maybe 9 years old or 8. No, 8 years old near 7. That would be 1978. I was 7 years old when I believe I remember seeing um, Bob Backlund, Bruno, Sam Bruno San Martino, and maybe superstar Billy Graham. Yes, I've seen them. I don't talk about them, but I've seen them. And they didn't need to use super strength to get over. They had character. So sometimes I think people just don't get it. But it was a very good match. The faces won. Oh, almost forgot. The botch that came from Pentagon Jr. when he grabbed Austin Aries did a short flip and Austin really looked like he jacked his neck. He's in my face right here. I am worried one of these days they're going to go too far with that and someone's neck is going to get totally jacked. I'm just hoping no one gets hurt. But they're going into lope. What is it? Um, Under pressure with this. Well, no, 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 no. Wait. I think in two weeks Matt Seidel is going against Phantasma and I believe on low pressure, under pressure, you're going to have... Pentagon Jr. go up against Austin Aries to try and reclaim his title. Austin Aries. But why isn't Austin Aries going to put up the grand championship? Wouldn't it be better for that as, unless you know Pentagon Jr. is not going to be staying after that because it's very close to when Lucha Underground is coming back. Now if they are going to be doing a joint work between Lucha Underground and Impact Wrestling, maybe Pentagon Jr. will be staying as champion and if anyone's Goes to the Lex Man's video, tell him that Pentagram, no, P Pentagon Jr., I don't know why I keep saying Pentagram, Pentagon Jr. is still champ. Come look at Impact. The guy keeps talking about it. Put your money where your mouth is, Alex. Come watch it. See if you like how they've been progressing. Now, um, Eli Drake and Big Papa Pump versus Z.E., I don't really feel very good about ZE. I'm not against DJ Z and Andrew Everett. Everett. I'm not against them. I like them. We rarely saw anything of them. We saw more of Eli Drake and Big Papa Pump compared to those other two. 
And the problem is that I think we need more of a character thing with the tag titles going into wrestling than just doing wrestling. Because we've done this before. We've done, we've done just plain wrestling. And I know a lot of people like it. But what have we gotten? What have we gotten when it came to LAX? And them just doing the backstage segments. Once in a while doing in-ring segments. And the majority of it doing wrestling. Not much. I want to see something in the ring promo segments. I want to see more fighting in the back. And then you do some wrestling. A little bit of a change up would have been better than having these guys break the backs of Eli Drake and Big Papa Pump. And now because of what happened with Eli Drake not winning last week. And now they're losing because Big Papa Pump whacked them in the head with a steel chair. And you wonder where they're going to go. It makes you think, well, maybe Eli might be turning face. You got Big Papa Pump going heel. And they're going to have a match maybe at Under Pressure. Or Slammiversary for that matter. I don't know. Maybe. I just, I kind of wish it had stretched a little bit longer than this. Because I want to see more in-ring segments of Big Papa Pump talking stupid. That man will make your ass laugh. That's just me. Now, I got to say this before I talk about Congo Kong and Guido. I have forgotten what winter look like. Because a lot of people left some comments saying, hey, this is winter. Kat, what is her name? Uh, Katarina is winter. Don't you realize that's winter? Well, guys, it's been maybe since 2000, what? When was the last time we saw winter with Angelina Love when she was doing that, that mind control thing? Maybe 2012? Maybe 2013? It's been a very long time since I've seen Winter. I forgot what she looks like. I hadn't seen her on the indies. So I completely forgot what the woman looked like. Yes, yeah, she's a gorgeous woman. And I believe she's about 40. Either in late 30s or early 40s. So, damn it all. Why can't I meet a woman like that in my age of 47? And she's early 40s and she looks like that. It's like meeting Rebel in the street. Rebel is maybe 42, 43 years old. I'm only four years older than she is. And she looks as young as I do. I know I'm, I'm not super young, but at least I look like in my mid-30s, I guess. Anyway, it, you wish to have a winter like that. But I forgot. I'm sorry. Now, what did we get? We get a question of who's the one who keeps leaving the exes. You got Guido confronting Jimmy Jacob. Saying, you're man, you're we man, you're the one who did this. Now, mind you, I'm not a Guido fan. I'm not a Guido fan. I don't know why they keep bringing him back. Why don't they just leave him as a manager? Or make him just a plain jobber? I know people like him. I just don't see the appeal. I don't. Rockstar Spud is ten times better than Guido. Because he put his ass all out there. When he did Boot Camp 1. Guido and Boot Camp 2. I believe he did Boot Camp 2. Did not do as well. But still people love him. I just. I'm, I'm not. Griping on the guy. Because he can't wrestle. He can't talk. He can do it. But he's not good at both of them. Is either one. Or the other. So Jimmy Jacob. Was basically taunted. By Katarina saying, my man can take out your man. And that's how we got this match. Which was funny as hell. Guido was chowing his inner Santino Morella doing the power walk. You can see it in my face. The boy was power walking around the ring. That, I will say, was funny. But in the end, it was a squash match. Leading into Moose going against Congo Kong. Which, honestly, there's nothing there. That I, it, This is the problem I see. There's nothing with the feud. There's nothing. That's one of the problems right now that Impact still has. You got great talent, but because of the poor build for most of them before the new management took over, and with the constraints that you have on Impact, because it is a two-hour show, it's hard, so hard, to book these guys and to make them presentable. 
And this is why I think they're dropping. When you show them on other promotions like um, BCW or Destiny Wrestling, the problem you're going to have is these guys are really not getting a proper build all the time. They're going straight into another another promotion with what little build they could do with them. And it just doesn't help. Now, let's talk about Eddie Edwards and Sammy Callahan in the street fight. I really don't understand why this couldn't be saved for under pressure. Finally, I said it without botching. <laughs> I don't know why this couldn't be saved for Slammiversary or under pressure. Why are they rushing this? This is the strongest feud they have. Literally. This feud is gold. It is gold. I really believe they could have stretched this to under pressure and culminated going into Slammiversary. Which I believe might be Eddie Edwards going against Tommy Dreamer. Because it really feels like it's going there. It feels like they're building into it. But in, I, I believe even though the match itself was not bad. It was a supposedly a street fight. It was mostly brutal. In the end, Sammy Callahan finally got his comeuppance. He lost to the Boston Knee Party. But then you get the choking action of the Eddie Edwards on him. They had to pull him off of him. And then you can see Eddie Edwards looking down on a Tommy Dreamer. And if you look at the very beginning before the match happened, Tommy is telling Eddie after this, we're done. He says, we're not done until he's not breathing. And he says, I understand, but we're done after this. We're done. This is where I do believe the leading Eddie Edwards to face Tommy Dreamer. I still believe this. I could be wrong. I do believe Alyssa is going to go to Tommy Dreamer because she's not going to be able to stand Eddie Edwards anymore. And this is where the feud between Eddie and Tommy are going to happen. Because his own wife doesn't feel safe with her husband. She's going to the most closest friend she has and a Tommy Dreamer. It, it feels like that would be the best way to do it. And if they are doing it, that means it's a well-built feud. I just wish they hadn't... They could have stretched it into the next pay-per-view. They could have stretched this into the next pay-per-view. And I believe that would have been better than actually ending it here. In the, at least in this situation. Now, um, what am I forgetting here? Um, Kira Hogan versus... <sighs> mm, how can I say this? I got it. First thing, Josh Matthews on commentary by himself was not very good. At, uh, no, I take that back. At first, for the, maybe the first 20 minutes of the show, it was okay. But as the show went on, it just seemed to... It, it just didn't feel right. He needs someone to play off of. Now, mind you, when it came to this match, Madison Rain came back. And you guys tell me below if Madison Rain had a boob job because her breasts looked way bigger than they were before. I know the slug daddy off the rope show, off the rope show central believes her to be goat face. I don't care if she's a goat face. She's not that bad looking. Nice body. I got low standards. <laughs> Actually, she's not a bad looking lady. And for what I understand, she's actually kind of nice. But anyway, when it came to... I am... I really want to like Tessa Blanchard. I just... She just doesn't feel like she's that good. Kira Hogan, on the other hand, is a better wrestler than her. Even though she has not worked in the business as long. You can see by the way she was performing in the ring. Straight Fire was performing very well. She was actually performing better than Te Telly, Blanchard's, Telly Blanchard's daughter. And I feel like I can understand the reason why NXT didn't hold her for very long. I think she really believes she's a lot more than what she is. Just because she's a third generation superstar does not mean she has what it takes to be a great wrestler. To be a great superstar, you need more than just in-ring ability. You have to have something. You got to have a tangible. You got to have the the it factor. And she just doesn't seem to have it with me. Maybe with more time, she'll grow. Uh, she'll grow on me, really. Because at this moment, she just doesn't grow on me. I didn't see anything interesting when I did see her in NXT. What few times I saw her, 
and I still don't see it here. And then once the beatdown happened and once the Madison Rain came to the ring to stop her, and here's a picture of her leaning down trying to help Kira. She does look like she got breast implants. She's chesty. <laughs> now you see that Tessa is going to have a feud with Madison Rain, which is understandable. It needed to happen. It should happen. But this is something that's kind of surprising. I know a lot of people don't like Madison Rain. But lately, in the last year or two, Madison Rain has been helping younger talent to get over. And that's a good thing. Not many female wrestlers will always help you to get over. And I gotta be honest here. Maybe because she doesn't have as much cred in the back as a... I'm not, I don't want to start a fight. But let's be honest. Comparing Gail Kim to Madison Rain, who has more credibility is going to be Gail Kim. Because she worked in WWE and in Impact Wrestling. But she might not be as humble as Madison Rain could be. I could be 100% wrong and Madison Rain could still be a bitch. But she's been helping out more talent. And she has not been in the spotlight that much. She made sure she jobbed decently well. But that's just me. And let's see. What's left to talk about? Um... Anything left? Nope. Here we go. Here we go. This is what I've been waiting for. The Fala Bob makeover. Yes, it was a short segment. Yes, it was stupid. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was freaking hilarious. You got KM bringing Fala Bob. Well, let's back up a little bit. KM bumps into Fala Bob and saying pretty much. He looks like a Rico, he looks like a Glacius. And he says, you need a makeover. He washes his hair, he puts water in his mouth, he basically messes with him, but still gets him dressed up with a tie, some sunglasses, walking down the hall, well, walking at the place that we're at, being cool, and even Kira Hogan played into this and saying, oh my gosh, hello. That short little bit made my day. I know it was stupid. It was funny. And that's something we don't have a lot of in wrestling that's done right. Remember the day when New Day was absolutely hilarious. Remember when the fashion police, the fashion popo, did their fashion files, which is so hilarious. These segments from now on look like they'll begin to grow on me. I'm really beginning to like Fala Ball messing around with Cam and Cam messing with Fala Ball, making it funny. I'm alright with it. I'm literally liking it. I could be wrong, the next one will suck, but if it's not, I was cool with this. Now, was the show good? Yes, it was. It was a good show, just with some minor things. But I'm not going to say it was a great show. It's a consistently good show. Last week we had a consistently good show, and the week before that we had a consistently good show. That's what I care about, and that's what's making me happy. But you guys tell me how you feel. Have a good day. Have a good night. Peace!